Hello, with that being said, the topic of today's halakha is, is life fair? That's really the, the main topic and how to keep hope alive throughout our difficulties. So through our challenges and through all of these different circumstances, how do we keep our, our hope alive? And this is a common question, whether it's with uh, little children, with adults, or whatever it may be, a common concept is that they ask, is life fair? Or this is unfair? Why is Allah doing this? And this is a question from when kids are three and four years old and they're always complaining about everything being unfair, all the way to us as a, a, adults. Um, when we're asking ourselves, when we're going through difficulties, why is Allah doing this to me? Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala putting me in this specific circumstance? Why am I the one that lost my job? Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala putting me in a car accident? Why is Allah making me struggle financially? Why, 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 why does Allah do this to me? And this stems from the same question when, when children ask, this is unfair, or when they say that this is unfair. So really the, the main core concept of and what we're going to analyze is the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I'm sorry for the mic. I'm not sure why the mic keeps breaking on and off. But we're going to analyze the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how he analyzed uh, difficulties and his circumstances and overcame them. How he managed to overcome them even though his challenges make ours look like nothing. His challenges and the difficulties that he went through make our difficulties, our obstacles, our dilemmas, these Burdens on our shoulders, they make it go, go to waste. They're, they're really shameful in the eyes the Prophet ﷺ went through. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, in Surah Al-Fajr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَمَّا الْإِنسَانُ إِذَا بِتَلَاهُ رَبُّهُ فَأَكْرَمَهُ وَنَعْعَمَهُ فَيَقُولُ رَبِّي أَكْرَمَهُ وَأَمَّا إِذَا مَبْتَلَاهُ فَقَدْرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقَ فَيَقُولُ رَبِّي أَهَانًا As for mankind, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts him in a difficulty or puts him in a challenge this is the most uncomfortable situation to be in when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts man in difficult circumstances or puts, or puts excuse me man in an easy circumstances puts man in terms of wealth gives man the test of being wealthy gives man ease and these easy circumstances throughout their lives the human being no the human being one more time. فَأَمَّا الْإِنسَانُ إِذَا مَبْتَلَاهُ رَبُّهُ فَأَكْرَمَهُ وَنَعَمَهُ فَيَكُولُ رَبِّي أَكْرَمًا As for mankind, as for human beings, when they're given a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, an easy test, so a test in terms of wealth, for example. And oftentimes we don't consider wealth or we don't consider an easy circumstance a test. We don't take this as a test. Oftentimes we only analyze tests when it's something difficult. When we're going through poverty, When we're going through poverty, or when we're going through a difficult circumstance, this is the only time that we consider it to be a test. <laughs> One more time. Astaghfirullah. <laughs> I'm sorry about this. So as for mankind, when he's put through a test of ease, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this man, this individual and this human being, when he's put through a test of ease, a test of wealth, a test where his life is going very easy, mankind says, my Lord has honored me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored me. And this is almost a form of boastfulness. He's being arrogant, similar to how in Surah Al-Kahf, the story of the cave, the man who has all of these gardens, he says, if ever the, the time will come, when the day of judgment will come, Allah is going to give me better than this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they think that this, their test in terms of dunya, is analyzing them in terms of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in front of Allah. So when man is afflicted with an easy calamity or an easy test, wealth, for example, he says, my Lord has honored me. And then, in contrast to that, وَأَمَّا إِذَا مَبْتَلَاهُ فَقَدْرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقَةً فَيَقُولُ رَبِّي أَهَانًا But this same man, this same human being, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala restricts his wealth just a little bit, when Allah takes away his finances just a tiny bit, just a tiny bit, Allah is now going to challenge him with something a little more difficult than being wealthy, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenges him and takes away his risk just a little. 
This man says, my Lord, this human being says, my Lord has, has put me to shame. My Lord has dishonored me. Now he's ashamed with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now he's not grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though during his time of ease, he said what? My Lord has honored me. And this is mankind's analysis. This is how us human beings analyze the tests from Allah. This is how we analyze it. We think that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us wealth or gives us something in this dunya, that it's something that has to be beneficial in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this in itself could be a test. Being wealthy in itself could be your test. And we can argue that in Islam, being wealthy is a more difficult test than being in poverty. One more time. So being wealthy in Islam is a greater test than being in poverty. And you may ask how? The Prophet wasallam he said that those who are wealthy, they're going to be asked about their wealth. Each of us, whether you're poor, whether you're rich, you're going to be asked about every dime and every nickel. But those who are wealthy, in, on the day of judgment, the ones who are wealthy and are going to enter into Jannah, those who are wealthy and enter into Jannah are going to enter 500 years later, min kathrat al-su'al, from how many questions they're going to be asked about their wealth. The ones who are wealthy are going to be put in Jannah 500 years later. Why? From how many questions they're going to be asked about their wealth. So as Muslims, we have to analyze our tests in the absolute perspective, not just in matters of dunya. So it may be that this wealth, yes, in itself, it's a blessing from Allah, and all, everything is a blessing from Allah. But this wealth in itself may be a bigger test than poverty. And the Prophet ﷺ, he went through each and every single test during his life. The Prophet ﷺ, he began during the earlier period of his life, he was a wealthy man. The Prophet ﷺ, when he married Khadija, he was a very wealthy man. She was wealthy. So by nature, the Prophet ﷺ became a wealthy man. So how did he pass this test? How did he pass the test of wealth? The Prophet ﷺ, his character did not change. His values did not change even the slightest bit. His morals were the same. Whether he was a rich man or a poor man, he was still the same human being who would give back to the poor. The one who would feed orphans. The one who would take care of the needy. Even though he was wealthy, he was still looking out for those who were less fortunate than him. And oftentimes we find that wealth and power in itself changes one's character, changes the persona of mankind. And even Khadija radiallahu anha knew this. She knew that those who are wealthy, their character tends to change just because of their wealth. And we know that most of the inhabitants of Jannah are going to be poor people. Now don't get me wrong, wealth isn't discouraged in our religion. Some of the greatest companions were wealthy. Abu Bakr, for example, was a wealthy, wealthy man. But wealth in itself is a greater test than poverty because when people get wealthy, oftentimes their character changes. And this is the exact opposite of the Prophet ﷺ. When he was wealthy, his character stayed exactly the same. He was the same exact man who would take time out to ask about his neighbors and be kind to the sick and feed the needy. He was the same man ﷺ. So he passed this test of wealth, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He passed that test. And then the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was struck with poverty. Extreme, extreme poverty. The Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, everything was taken away from him. His family members, his home, his support from his tribe, his community, his hometown, everything was taken away from the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Everything was stripped away from him. So how did he pass this test? And remember, we're analyzing his life so that we can implement it into our own. So when he was wealthy, for those of us who are wealthy or who are financially able, we have to analyze how he is during his moments of wealth. How does he pass this test of being wealthy? And money goes, money comes and money goes. So all of us are going to be put in financial hardships. So how did the Prophet ﷺ pass the test of being in poverty with sabr, with patience. He exhibited a beautiful patience, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was patient with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
He knew that whatever calamity struck him, whatever obstacle struck him, that it was merely a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala threw his way, whichever obstacle he threw at him, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was capable of handling it. Similar to how all of us, when we go through obstacle and hardship, we're able to overcome it. We have to put aside the excuses that we're not able to handle it. We're able to overcome it. We wouldn't be put in the challenge if Allah knew that we weren't capable of overcoming it, capable of defeating it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. The famous ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not burden a soul beyond what it can bear. So your test may be different than the person sitting next to you. My test may be different than your test, but all of us are put in some type of test. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Ankabut, He says, أَحَسِبَ النَّاسُ أَن يُتْرَكُوا أَن يَكُولُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ Do people think that they're going to say we believe and they will not be tested? Do we think that this Jannah, this gift, this prize is going to come easy? Do we really think we're not going to be tested for Jannah? We're tested each and every single day for this gift, this prize at the end of the road of Jannah. Every single day we're tested. And Allah promised that we're going to be tested. Some of us in terms of wealth, some of us in terms of health, some in terms of hunger, some in terms of fear, some in this, in this. But everyone is going to be tested. And everyone's test is individualized to them and what they can handle. But we're all capable of handling the test that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in front of us. So like we said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he went through immense poverty. Everything was stripped away from him and he exhibited patience. He exhibited a beautiful patience during this time and this is how he passed this test of poverty sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was given the test of al-kafaf, having just enough. And mind you, our just enough as American Muslims is luxurious compared to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his just enough. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would make dua to Allah for this, for al-kafaf, for just enough. Because we know that like we said, being wealthy is a difficult test. It's not easy to be wealthy. It may look from the outside as being a very easy and luxurious lifestyle, but it's a difficult test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And similarly, being in immense poverty is difficult. It's not easy to be poor or be in financial difficulty or financial stress. It's a difficult obstacle. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would ask for just enough. Just enough to get by. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his just enough, his apartment, when he used to make sujood, he would tap the legs of Aisha radiallahu anha so he would have room to make sujood. This is how small his apartment was. And this to him was just enough. For us, this would be, I need a donation, brother. Give me a donation. If you, need, if you had an apartment this small, we would be complaining. We live in mansions now and we complain, subhanAllah. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he didn't have room to make sujood. But this for him was, was enough. To him, this was enough. There was even a time, and this is a famous story, but there was a time when the Prophet ﷺ was resting inside his home. He was sleeping inside his house. And Umar ibn al-Khattab, he walked in on the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet rose from his bed. And his bed isn't a queen-size mattress. His bed was a bunch of straws stuffed with leather. So naturally, he had marks on his back. There were marks on his back from where he used to sleep. So Omar ibn Khattab, he immediately started to cry. Upon seeing this and the marks on the back of the Prophet ﷺ, he started to cry. And the Prophet ﷺ, he looked at him and he said, why are you crying? The Prophet ﷺ was confused. Why are you crying? What's wrong? So Omar ibn Khattab, as he was crying, he said, I have seen the palaces of Caesar and the palaces of Rome. I have seen how other kings live. I have seen how other kings live like, and you deserve better than this. What is Omar ibn Khattab saying? What is he saying? The same thing we're saying 1400 years later. 
that this isn't fair. This isn't fair. Why are you living like this? Why are you going through this difficulty? SubhanAllah, the same exact thing we're saying 1400 years later, this isn't fair. And the Prophet ﷺ, he could have easily said, go build me a house or tell everyone now that you saw me, go build me a nice mattress or something. The Prophet ﷺ responds to Umar and he says, أَلَا تَرْضَى أَنَّ لَهُمُ الدُّنْيَا وَلَنَا الْآخِرَةِ Doesn't it satisfy you that they have dunya, that they have this world and we have the akhirah and we have the hereafter? Doesn't that satisfy you? SubhanAllah, with the utmost conviction, this, this was a man who was a prophet from Allah who had marks on his back from where he used to sleep. And he's the one saying to his companions, doesn't it satisfy you? Aren't you satisfied? Aren't you satisfied? And even the companions, subhanAllah how the, the mindset has shifted. Even the companions, they used to complain about life being unfair. But when they complained, they complained in terms of the hereafter. And I'll explain what I mean through a story. There was once a time when the companions, they came to the Prophet ﷺ, the poor companions, came to the Prophet ﷺ, complaining about the rich companions. So we know that some of the companions were poor, some of the companions were well off. So the poor companions come to the Prophet ﷺ, complaining about those who are rich. And they're not complaining and saying, they pray like we pray, we pray like they pray, they have these nice houses. They're not complaining about how they live. Look at their complaints. They go to the Prophet ﷺ complaining. And they say to the Prophet ﷺ, it's not fair. They have money to give sadaqah with. They're worried, their main concern is that they have money to give in charity. Look, look at how they're thinking, subhanAllah. They're thinking in terms of the hereafter. How am I going to attain Jannah like them when they have this leverage on me? They have the leverage of sadaqah, of charity. SubhanAllah, how the mindset has shifted. They're complaining about the fact that they can't give charity. SubhanAllah. So the Prophet ﷺ, he, he started smiling. And imagine this was an ummah who in the times of Jahiliyyah, they would bury their daughters alive. And imagine how far he had come with this community of his. So the Prophet ﷺ, rather than making them feel bad because they're poor, out of, the, out of his wisdom, he responded and he asked them, don't you have something you can give charity with as well? Isn't there something that you can give charity with as well? And they were confused. They, they had nothing. They were poor. Some of them lived in the back of the masjid. They were poor. So the Prophet ﷺ, he told them, say subhanAllah. Everyone say subhanAllah. Alhamdulillah, say Alhamdulillah, say Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, say La ilaha illallah. You guys are half asleep, man, I don't know how you guys are even here. All of these, the Prophet ﷺ told them, are forms of charity. All of these are forms of charity, and the Prophet ﷺ told these poor companions, if you don't have money, then do this, at least say this, this is your form of sadaqah, this is your charity. So he's giving them something that they can give charity with since they're poor and they don't have much to give. So now they were happy. They were satisfied. They were content. But then they came back later complaining to the Prophet ﷺ. The rich companions found out about what the poor companions were told by the Prophet ﷺ. And now they were doing that too. So not only were they rich and giving in charity, in their wealth. Now they were also saying, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. They were doing that too. So the poor companions now, they were frustrated. They were, they were mad. So the Prophet wasallam he smiled and he said, that's the blessing and the bounty of Allah. And he gives it to whom he wills. This is the blessing of Allah. Not everyone that's wealthy thinks like these people. Not everyone that's wealthy says, SubhanAllah and Alhamdulillah. Some people, like we said before, when, we, when afflicted with wealth, they become arrogant or boastful or whatever it may be and they don't realize that they need to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't realize that when in moments of wealth, this is all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not our resume or our degree or our networking skills. None of this can come true without the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We wouldn't have got that job without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala putting his barakah into that, into that interview. 
even though we studied hard, it couldn't have been done without the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We wouldn't have passed that exam. So we have to understand even during our moments of ease that it's only because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we're in that position. So even in our moments of ease, we have to be grateful. And in our moments of difficulty, we have to be patient. This is how we pass both of these tests. So the Prophet ﷺ, he smiled and he told them, as we said, he said, this is the blessing of Allah, the bounty of Allah, and he gives it to whom he wills. So not everyone that's, ri that's rich and wealthy is going to be like these people. And this is where this hadith stems from, the hadith I'm about to say, and if you don't take anything away and you don't want to wake up throughout the and rest of the talk, then just wake up for these two minutes. The hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, that really analyzes what it means to be successful and be content. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ أَسْلَمَ وَرُزِقَ كَفَافَ وَقَنَّاهُ اللَّهُ بِمَا آتَى He's talking about what makes someone successful. The one who is successful first and foremost is the one who has accepted Islam. The one who has submitted to the will of Allah. The one who is obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with him and he is pleased with Allah. Radiallahu anhum wa radu an. They are pleased with Allah. They're pleased with the legislation of Allah. They're pleased with the rules and regulations that Allah has put on them. Because understanding that these regulations are for us. They're for our own good. Whether we see it or not, whether we see the benefit of it of... That Arab mentality came out. Whether we see the benefit of it or not, this is all good from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a blessing in everything. It may be that you hate something and it's good for you. It may be that you hate something and it's good for you. And it may be that you love something and it is bad for you. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. So the first criteria to being successful and content is being obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Qad aflaha man aslama. The first one is the, the first prerequisite to everything that comes next in the hadith is the one who has submitted to the will of Allah. The one who has accepted Islam and is obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the second prerequisite to being successful and content, وَرُزِقَ kafafa, And he has been given just enough. He has been given just enough to get by. And like we said, our just enough may be different than the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Our just enough, our kafaf may be different. And as American Muslims, man, we're spoiled. Our just enough is so much more than anyone else around the world. Subhanallah. Our just enough is three meals with meat on the table every day. If you don't walk into an Arab's house or a Desi's house and there's meat on the table, it's like, man, I'm leaving. I can't stay here. Subhanallah, some people have meat on Eid and just on Eid. Subhanallah, how our just enough, our kafaf has changed. What is enough to satisfy us has changed completely from the time of the companions. It has changed completely, drastically. So the Prophet wasallam says, has been given just enough. And the continuation to that, وَقَنَّاهُ اللَّهُ بِمَا آتَاهُ he has been given enough and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has satisfied him with what he has given him. Has satisfied him, has convinced him that what he gave him is enough. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give you and give you and give you. But you're never going to be content. Unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala convinces you that it's enough. This is when you're truly going to feel content and happy. When you're truly convinced that what Allah has given you is enough. When we say Alhamdulillah that what Allah has given us in terms of a difficulty and an obstacle is able to be overcome. This is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strikes us with difficulty and obstacle and this is when we are able to overcome it. We know that we're able to overcome it. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises that we're able to overcome our difficulty and our challenges. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises this. So this is the third prerequisite in the hadith, how to be successful. The one who submits to the will of Allah. And the one who has been given enough, 
But at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has convinced him that what he has is enough. And I'll say a story, inshallah, and I'll conclude with this story to leave time for uh, discussion, inshallah. And this is a story from the end of Surah Al Qalam. And just to kind of introduce the story, oftentimes when we fall into difficulties or obstacles or calamities, we oftentimes get hopeless. This is just our, our natural state as human beings. We feel that there's no hope. I have this big exam coming up and there's just no hope. I'm financially in distress and there's no hope. There's no hope in this, there's no hope in this. When we're struck with difficulty and obstacles, sometimes we think there's no hope. There's no way out. So I'm going to talk about a story of a prophet, Prophet Yunus alayhi salam, who was in the most hopeless situation you can argue in the entire Quran. It can be argued that the story of Yunus alayhi salam might be the most hopeless situation in the whole Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, towards the end of Surah Al-Qalam, He tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, فَاصْبِرْ لِحُكْمِ رَبِّكْ وَلَا تَكُنْ كَصَاحِبِ الْحُوتِ إِذْ نَادَى وَهُوَ مَكْذُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be patient. To be patient with his community, to be patient with these people, these new people entering into Islam, this new community, be patient with them. And do not be like the companion of the whale who only called upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during his moment of anguish when he was in a completely hopeless situation. And just for, for reference, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was always approached by companions who would say, when is the help of Allah coming? When is Allah going to give us his aid? When is Allah's barakah going to... When is this? When is this? When is this? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would always say, be patient. Be patient. This was his response. Whenever someone came to him and said, when are you going to call Allah to help us? When is Allah's aid going to come? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would always say, be patient. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet, the one who tells everyone else to be patient, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling him to be patient. He's reminding him to be patient with these, this community, this new deen, this new religion. And this is a reminder to all of us as well to be patient with one another. Be patient during our moments of difficulty. Be patient when someone new enters into the religion. Be patient. Exhibit patience. Have, be patient with one another. Oftentimes, we're so, we're at our, our threshold with one another and we always tick, we always explode against one another. Especially during Ramadan, man, when it hits that time for iftar, that 10 minute window, everyone's gonna flip out on each other. That te last 10 minutes of Ramadan is like, that's it, it's like a red meter. So we have to be patient with one another, regardless what the circumstance may be. We have to be able to be patient, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Prophet to be patient and to not be like the companion of the will. So who is this companion? The story of Yunus alayhi salam, Yunus alayhi salam came to the people of Iraq. Yunus alayhi salam came to the people of present day Iraq. And just like many of the other prophets and messengers that came before him and after him, his community rejected him. Over and over and over, he would preach the message, which is a common theme in the Quran. He would preach the message and his people would reject him. He would preach the message and his people would reject him. He would preach the message, people rejecting him. So Yunus alayhi salam became impatient. He, he thought there was no hope. He said, man, I've been giving da'wah to these people, this community of disbelievers, all of these people. I've been giving them da'wah for so long. There's no hope. There's no way they're going to accept Islam. There's just no way. There's no hope in these people, in this community. So he decided on his own without asking the permission of Allah or getting the permission of Allah, Yunus alayhi salam decided that he was going to abandon his people. He decided he was going to leave this community. He said there was no hope in them anyway, so he's going to leave them. He's going, he decided to abandon them. So as he's going to abandon them, he decides that he's going to board a ship. That's how, how he's going to get away from his people. He's going to board a ship. And as soon as he's about to board this ship and get on the ship to go away and abandon his people, he sees a dark, dark clouds forming in the sky. 
this dark, dark cloud start to form in the sky when he's about to leave his community. And he thinks that this, these black clouds are what's going to destroy his nation. He thinks that these black clouds in the sky, they must be what's going to destroy my community, this community of disbelievers. This must be it. And uh, he decides to board that ship and he decides to abandon them. He, he goes through with the plan of leaving his people. And as soon as he boards that ship, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through pretty much a miracle, these people, this community of disbelievers, turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and repent. The, imagine this. This isn't a common trend in the Quran. The whole community came together and turned back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the community that Yunus alayhi salam thought was hopeless and there was no hope and no way that they were going to turn back to Allah, all of them collectively turned back to Allah. Collectively, as a community. But Yunus alayhi salam had already left them. He had already abandoned them. So Yunus alayhi salam, like we said, he boarded a ship. And when he got onto that ship, those black clouds that we mentioned before, started raining really, really heavy on that ship. It started pouring onto that ship to the degree that the ship itself started to rock. The ship that Yunus alayhi salam was on, it started to rock. Because of this heavy rain, this black cloud, if you remember from the beginning. He thought it was going to destroy his people, but now it started to rain heavy on his ship. And the boat started to rock, and all of the people on the ship, they, they decided they're going to throw all of their luggage into the water to try to balance out the ship. But the ship continued to rock, even after they threw their luggage overboard. The ship continued, it was unsteady. So they decided they were going to throw one of the people on the ship overboard. And they decided they were going to throw Yunus alayhi salam overboard into the water. So now a prophet of Allah is on this ship and is about to be thrown over into the water. Subhanallah, just the, the, the vision of it or the illustration of it is, is scary. It's raining heavy on the ship and he's about to be thrown into the water. So he's thrown into the water by this people of the ship and he goes into the water and a whale takes him and swallows him, gulps Yunus alayhi salam. So Yunus alayhi salam, this whale now dives to the bottom of the ocean and Yunus alayhi salam is now in the stomach of a whale at the bottom of an ocean. I know none of us have been in the stomach of a whale at the bottom of an ocean. I mean, we think our obstacles compare to it, but really they don't. So Yunus alayhi salam, like I said, this is probably the most hopeless situation you can say maybe in the whole Quran. In the bottom of the ocean, in the stomach of a whale. And Yunus alayhi salam, he, realized, he thought he was dead. I mean, he was swallowed up by a whale, but he realizes that he's able to move. He still, he feels that he's still alive, but he's in the stomach of this whale. So Yunus alayhi salam, he decides he's going to call upon who? Allah. The only one who can help him. And this is the same mentality that we have to have. That even during our most hopeless situations, in our moments of despair, we're always able to turn back to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's doors are always going to be open. When everyone else turns us away and closes their doors, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always open. We can always call upon Allah. We can always call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for His aid and for His barakah, whenever and wherever we're in, what situation we're in. So Yunus alayhi salam, he decides to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the famous dua. La ilaha illa ant subhanaka inni kuntu min al La ilaha illallah. So Yunus alayhi salam, he says, there is no God but you, O Allah. How beautiful are you, O Allah. How glorious are you, ya Allah. Inni kuntu min al I have wronged my own soul. I have transgressed my own soul. I have made a mistake. So Yunus alayhi salam is now turning back to Allah and telling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he's made a mistake. He needs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help. There's no one else who can save him in the bottom of the ocean, in the stomach of a whale. There's no way out. There's no way he's going to get out. And he calls upon Allah even during his hopeless situation. 
he still has the mentality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to take him out of this dilemma. Whatever is hard for us is easy for Allah. This is easy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as soon as he makes this dua to Allah, the whale immediately spits Yunus back out into the water. Subhanallah, as soon as Yunus makes this dua, the whale spits Yunus back up into the water. And Yunus alayhi salam, he continues to repeat this dua over and over and over on his way back to his people. So now he's going to go back to this community that he left. He had abandoned them and now he continues to repeat this dua over and over on his way back to his people. So he gets back to this community that was once disbelievers, that he thought were once hopeless and, and lost. He comes back to them and he sees them all worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This whole community who he thought were disbelievers and were hopeless are now all worshipping Allah and want Yunus alayhi salam to teach them the religion. They want someone to teach them this deen. Now they want to learn how to be closer to Allah. So who better than Yunus alayhi salam? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, If it hadn't been for the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the miracle of Allah, for the blessing that Allah put in this whole adventure, Yunus alayhi salam would still be in the bottom of the ocean. If it hadn't been for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Yunus would still be in the stomach of the whale. If it hadn't been for the blessing of Allah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, فَاشْتَبَاهُ رَبُّهُ فَجَعَلَهُ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose Yunus alayhi salam and made him amongst the righteous. Made him amongst those who were pious. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose Yunus alayhi salam. Why? Because Yunus alayhi salam realized that even during his moment of difficulty, during a tragedy, a calamity, an obstacle, whatever you want to call it, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was still there. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was still going to answer his call. Yunus alayhi salam was still confident in Allah even after all that he went through. He still had hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He still had hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to illustrate the, the, the memorable story of Yunus alayhi salam, after the battle of Ta'if, during that battle and after it, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sitting in a garden. The siege of Ta'if, I guess you can call it. This was probably one of the most hopeless situations for the Prophet ﷺ. One of the most difficult sieges and moments in his life was this, this moment of Ta'if. So the Prophet ﷺ is sitting in a garden. And the people, they see him sitting in that garden and he's upset. He's devastated by this whole siege, this battle. He's upset. So they decide that they're going to send him a gift to try to cheer him up. So they send one of their servants, Adas, they send this servant to the Prophet ﷺ with some grapes to try to cheer up the Prophet ﷺ, try to make him feel better because he's feeling down. So they give him, they tell this servant to go give him some grapes. So Adas, he goes to the Prophet ﷺ and he's giving him these grapes to try to make him feel better. And just to illustrate, this is probably the most hopeless situation for the Prophet ﷺ. This is probably one of the most difficult situations he, he was going through in his life. It was this moment of thought, the siege of thought. So Adas, he gives him the grapes. And the Prophet wasallam he says, Bismillah. In the name of Allah, as he's about to begin eating the grapes. And Adas, he asks the Prophet wasallam he says, Where did you learn these words? Uh, our people don't say these words. Bismillah. What, what is this? What are these words you're saying? And the Prophet ﷺ, he looked at him and he said, where are you from? And he said, I'm from Iraq. Ninewa, Ninewa in Iraq. And the Prophet ﷺ, he began to smile. And he said, Min ard nabi salih wal abd salih Yunus ibn Matta. You're from the land of the noble prophet and the noble servant, Yunus ibn Matta. 
And the man, Adas, he looks at him and he says, وَمَا يُدْرِكَ أَنَّهُ نَبِي How do you know that he is a prophet? How do you know that this man, Yunus, is a prophet? And the Prophet ﷺ, he says, هُوَ نَبِي وَأَنَا نَبِي And the prophets are brothers in faith. He is a prophet and I am a prophet and the prophets are brothers in faith. So even during the Prophet ﷺ's most hopeless situation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought him a reminder of a situation that was hopeless just like his. From the man Yunus, the Prophet Yunus alayhi salam, who went through a situation that was just as hopeless as his. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings him a reminder from the people of Yunus alayhi salam to remind him of the struggle that Yunus alayhi salam went through and how he overcame it. So during, just to wrap up, during our moments of difficulty and our moments of tribulation and our trials and all of these circumstances that we go through, we have to really analyze it in perspective and compare it and put it on a scale compared to some of these difficulties. Some of these stories in the Quran, they're not just fairy tales. These are real stories that happen to real people. Oftentimes we read them as just fairy tales and just, and just novels, but these are real people. These stories are real and we have to extract the values and morals out of these stories. How did the Prophet ﷺ deal with those who were difficult with him? Those who mocked him? How did the Prophet ﷺ deal with financial distress? How did he deal with his neighbors? How did he deal with those who were harsh with him? And we have to implement these into our own challenges. Our own difficulties. When we're going through moments of financial distress, Look only to the life of the Prophet When we deal with the death of a family member, look at the Prophet When we analyze any situation, we have to realize that there's always hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When everyone else has closed their doors, when everyone else is saying that life is unfair, realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always fair. Although life may not seem to be fair, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always fair. He's always going to put challenges in us that we're able to overcome. And this is how we have to take on these challenges, these obstacles head on, that we're able to overcome these difficulties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in our way. So inshallah with, with that, I'll conclude the halaqa inshallah and uh, if anyone has any questions, inshallah, we'll take on questions or a discussion, inshallah. You guys are still looking at me the same way you started. Does anyone have any comments or suggestions or discussion or anything at all? All right. Nobody has anything, so I was crystal clear on everything that I said, or any of the stories. I can't. Can you repeat what he said after he said Less stressed. <laughs> so vertical So he uh, was kind of taking the, the takeaway message and the, the take home message from the, the talk. And I guess I'll just reiterate kind of what he said and just what he talked about. Um, the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, uh, 
do not despair in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Oh, my servants who have transgressed, do not despair in the mercy of Allah. Do not think that the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is too far. Do not think that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His aid is too far away from whatever obstacle you're going through. Don't think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His victory and His aid isn't near. When you take steps to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wallahi Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take steps towards you. When you make the intention to overcome that challenge, to wake up in the morning for Fajr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will follow through with barakah on that intention. When you take through the steps to avoid the job that may deal with haram, wallahi Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open avenues that you've never seen. When you make an effort to do things in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, regardless how many things and obstacles are in your way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open doors that you've never thought were going to open. So regardless what difficulty and what challenge we're going through, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has doors that you can't imagine. Our wisdom and our knowledge can only go so far. So we have to really put that in perspective. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the all wise. So even though we're going through this difficulty, remind ourselves that it's good for us. Remind ourselves that this challenge is good for us. This difficulty is taking away sins. It's removing sins from my life. Every time that I sin, this difficulty is taking one by one. Every single sin is going away slowly by slowly because of this illness, because of this financial hardship, because of this, because of this. So when we're in our moments of difficulty, really analyze and, and see what it means to be patient. Really express this beautiful patience. The same one Yaqub experienced when Yusuf السلام, was, went away. When he didn't know where his own son was, exhibit the same patience when we're going through difficulty and through challenges. And similarly, when we're going through an easy time and everything seems to be going smoothly, be grateful. Show gratitude. This is a test too. Don't think that when everything is going smooth and easy that Allah isn't testing you. This may be a bigger test than being in poverty. At least when you're in poverty, you know Allah is testing you. At least when you're poor, you know, it's a, you know you're going through a test. You have it hard. But when you're going through an easy moment, you may overlook that it's actually a test. You may overlook that it's actually a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So be grateful. This ease and this moment of ease would not be possible without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is kind of the, the, the takeaway message. So does anyone else have any, any point, points or comments or suggestions at all? Or anything they'd like to hear repeated that they didn't understand, maybe in the talk? All right. Okay. Thank you guys so much for listening.